Hello and welcome to Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier. I'm joined here today by Bob Blanchard, who has published uh, this book here, Lost Burlington, Vermont, a history of uh, some of the architecture in Burlington and what we've lost and what we've managed to uh, keep around in terms of the buildings in Burlington. So, Bob, thank you so much for joining us today and um, glad to learn a little bit more about uh, what uh, got this book going and uh, also some of the some of the stories that you've packed into here which are which are really impressive but sure. do you want to just start by talking a little bit about how um, this book came about and how you got involved in sort of citizen history and Burlington history sure well you know I, I was born and raised in Burlington South End and um, when I went to college at UVM I majored in history and I always I've always been interested in it and uh, you know then got married had kids had a long career and um, just didn't have time to really do anything with it. It was like to read about it, but that was about it. So then I retired and it wasn't immediate, but you know, at some point I decided to start doing something with it. It's a long winter here, as, as you know, and it's a great uh, hobby for me. I don't ski or anything like that. So, so I started getting into it um, via Facebook because I saw these other groups. I joined one and did some posts and um, you know, I just, decided to go out on my own. Uh, that's, that was uh, September of 2019. And so um, I didn't know what to expect. I thought, you know, if I get two, 300 people, that, that'd be great, you know? And then um, I started posting. My goal was to put photos on that had not been on the internet before. And so um, it started to really attract people and word spread. And I, I was getting 200 people a week, you know, for the first several years it was crazy so it really grew and grew and um and over time a lot of people said why don't you write a book bob and oh i'd love to have this in a book and so forth so that was kind of what motivated me to write a book i never intended to but you know as i said on my facebook group when i introduced the book uh, i don't really have a great deal of confidence in the permanence of anything on the internet even facebook uh and um that coupled with the fact that people had asked for it was what motivated me to you know put it on paper. Yeah, and as a member of this Facebook group, I'm, I'm always incredibly impressed by just the sheer amount of stories and photos and documentation that you have access to of Burlington history and are able to bring to the surface. Where is all this coming from? <laughs> I think well, uh, a lot of it comes from the internet. Uh, you know, there's a lot out there. But if you just Google, you know, like Burlington, Vermont old photos, you'll kind of find photos that have been on the internet for years the UVM buildings, uh, the Masonic Temple, and so forth. Um, you really have to dig to find new images. I mean, and dig and dig and drill down multiple layers. Uh, the Internet Archive has a lot of interesting stuff, but you really have to drill a lot of dry holes to, to find some, some gold. <laughs> but the main source for you know quality photos is UVM Special Collections. There's no question about that. They have this massive trove of uh, information and photos um, I talk about the James DeTorey archive all the time. There, there's two main uh, photographers who chronicled Burlington in, in the 20th century, uh, L.L. McAllister, and his, uh, most of his photos have been digitized on UVM site. So they've been kind of mined over and over again. You see them in books and so forth. But the DeTorey, the um, I knew about DeTorey actually from an old uh, Channel 17 <laughs> show from about 30 years ago. And these two guys were talking about James DeTorey, and I had never heard of him, and they showed some of his photos, and I said, wow. So I did some digging, and it turns out he's got like 40,000 photos at UVM, but they're all negatives. Mm -hmm. So it took me a long time to kind of figure out, you know, how to, how to do it. But I, I finally managed to go through them all, and um, not all of them are, you know, of, of general interest. Most aren't. Um, family portraits and pictures of your dog and things like that. But there's many, many thousands that are you know of general interest that I now have and a lot of them have never been seen before except for people at uh, you know special collections really so it's really uh, been I, I've been really you know mining that uh, <laughs> that load on the group for you know quite a while the last couple of months at least because you know they're they're great photos and the quality is really good and, and and a lot of them are of things that people remember you know which is great. And so there, you know, there's tons of photos, but you have a story behind every one of them. How do you know so much about well, what, what happened in Burlington? I don't know all that much, but I, 
I'm a digger, you know, and I have a really good memory. Those are the two things. People say, are you a historian? No, I'm a digger with a good memory. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I, I come across stuff when I'm doing research for other things. I stumble across really interesting stories that I didn't know about. And I, I kind of figure if I don't know about it, probably most people don't either because, you know, I done so much digging I probably know more than the average Joe or Jane and um, so a lot of just uh, the stories just come from that uh, you know and I've done a lot of reading of you know the previous uh, previously published books about Burlington and um, but a lot of what you know is kind of like the the unknown stuff uh, I just kind of come uh, uh, come upon from like a photo uh, I'll find a photo and I'll say oh that's I wonder what that is and you start digging and you know you find out what the photo was. A lot of times, the Tory information is really scant or even non-existent as far as what it is. Um, but you, you'll find a little sign in the background, or you know, something that'll tell you what you're looking at. And my main reference is reference uh, material is for information is the newspaper archives. Uh, all of the Burlington papers, going back to when they were first published, um, are all online. Yeah, at newspapers.com so that's a tremendous resource because as I like to say for about over a century everything was in the paper and I mean everything when a store clerk went from one store to another that was in the paper everything was in the paper so it's a really tremendous resource yeah. yes yeah and so lots of stories coming from those papers and yeah. um, one of them is about the corner that's behind us yeah. and uh, Bob I'm hoping you can just tell us a little bit about the history of the building that was on this corner and and what what it looks like now yeah well this uh, corner is where a building stood that to me is one of the most egregious <laughs> examples of knocking down a historic building uh, with a terrible result. Uh, this corner, and it's the corner of Clark and Pearl Street, and um, you can see there's a parking lot there right now. But in 1884, uh, there was a beautiful building that opened there, and it was called the Howard Mission House, or sometimes it's called the Howard Relief Building. And that was funded by Louisa Howard, who also funded the Mortuary, mortuary Chapel in uh, Lakeview Cemetery. And she was um, the, the daughter of John Howard, who was an early hotel operator in Burlington, did quite well. I think that's where her money came from, inheriting it from him. She also had a couple of brothers who went into the hotel business in New York City, and one in particular, John P. Howard, John Purple Howard, he became really wealthy, and he, he funded a lot of Burlington buildings, the Howard Opera House on Church Street is probably the best known, but many, many others. Um, so Louisa was very interested in charity, taking care of the poor and so forth. And um, back in those days, there really wasn't any public charity outside of the poor house. So, so Louisa, um, she never married and she was quite sickly uh, and, sh and she really devoted her life to you know, funding through her inheritance, uh, this building and other, other charities. So this building went up, 1884, it was a beautiful chateau style building and right across the street is the Richardson um, where Abernathy's used to be for those, you know, that remember that. And this building here was a really great architectural complement to the Richardson. It, it had turrets and so forth. Um, so what happened was the building served as this um, headquarters of the Howard Relief Society. And the Howard name continues to this day. The Howard Center is still in business. Uh, so her charity, you know, put down roots. And but what happened was uh, by the 60s, Church Street was under a lot of pressure. The stores from uh, shopping centers in the, you know, out in the suburbs, they had acres and acres of free parking. That was the big advantage. And so Abernathy's, which had been around for decades and decades, they were feeling the pinch. Several of the stores that had been in Burlington for over a century closed. So there was a lot of pressure to, to make it easier for people to park. There were no parking garages back then. So the Howard Relief Society outgrew this building by then. And so they wanted to build elsewhere. So they put the building up for sale in 1964. The asking price was $35,000 tell you what's happened to money um, and there's a uh, picture uh, photograph of the building with a for sale sign on it and um, in that same picture at the right you can see a sign for the visiting nurse association they were in the building at that time 
So Abernathy's said, oh, okay, very convenient to our store. We need parking. So they bought the building with the intention of tearing it down. Um, and I've stated this repeatedly on the group and in the book and everything else. Um, there was just one little blurb in the free press about the fact that this building was going to be torn down and that it was going to be a parking lot and there was no outrage at all. Nobody said a peep. You used to be able to write letters to the editor back then. You know, I couldn't find any anything in terms of, certainly not, the free press didn't <laughs> voice any uh, alarm at this. And, uh, you know, so it, it really was before historic preservation had taken a hold, you know, locally. And it was really just getting off the ground nationally. So the, the wreckers came in. Um, I sent you a photo of the actual demolition of the building. So, so this, the demolition of this building is probably one of the best documented lost buildings uh, I've seen because we got a beautiful picture by DeTore, uh, probably in the 40s, of the building. Uh, then we have the building for sale. Then we have <laughs> it partially demolished. And then we have the parking lot. So uh, 60 years later, still a parking lot. So that's the worst outcome imaginable for a historic building is to be replaced by a parking lot, in my opinion. Right, and that's kind of a pattern in the book and a few other instances. There's, you know, these these buildings are being lost without a lot of civic participation or input. And, you know, we think of Burlington now as a place that prides itself on its, you know, its its commitment to civic input. So what's changed about Burlington that, uh, you know, and, and the way that we treat our buildings? Well, I like I said, I think nationally it really got going. I, I constantly refer to the demolition of the Pennsylvania Railroad Station in New York City. That was a, it was built like a Roman temple. It was incredible. It took a whole, it sat on an entire city block in midtown Manhattan and the building was amazing. And they just tore it down. It took over two years to tear that building down. So there was a little group that protested that, but they couldn't stop it. But after it was gone, everybody down there said, what did just happen? What did we allow to happen? So that really got things going nationwide. 64, like I said, this was torn down without a peep. So it hadn't really gotten to Burlington yet. But um, over time, the bishop's house on South William Street the Catholic Bishop's house, that was an old big mansion, beautiful woodwork inside, you know, and the hospital wanted to knock it down for a parking lot. This was in the early 80s. There was, by that time, a storm of opposition locally. Um, there were citizens groups, Save the Bishop's House, lawyers who were doing lots of pro bono work, figuring out ways to try to stop it. And they delayed it for a couple of years, but it finally did get torn down. Um, you know, so there's, there's this balance, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, about the, the balance between private property rights and historic preservation. It's a real tough balance to strike. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Another thing that tracks in your book is this uh, arc of the, the, the beginning of Burlington history being defined by um, wealthy uh, capitalists coming and making their fortune on uh, the industrialized Burlington waterfront. Right. And then fast forward 100, 150 years, 200 years later, and Burlington is a place that's known for uh, not only its civic participation, but its public investment. It's one of the only cities in the United States with a socialist mayor. Um, so is there any way that the history of Burlington's buildings at all can reflect or tell us anything about the history of Burlington's cultural and, and political path? I think, I think the best example of what you're talking about is the actual waterfront itself. Um, as you said, it was a haven for industry, and many, many people made a lot of money. It was mainly the lumber industry down in the waterfront, and that started back in the 1820s with boats bringing lumber to be processed into Burlington, and it, and it carried on for, oh, goodness, close to 100 years, and um, so there's photos of the waterfront, I sent you one, uh, where it's covered with mills and factories and stacks of lumber and an, actually a giant pile of sawdust and shavings, which they used to fuel their uh, boilers. And so that was like the humming industrial waterfront. Then it kind of dried up because a lot of it had to do with a tariff that was put on lumber. You couldn't send um, processed lumber from Canada without paying a huge tariff. So the 
they had the mills up there to do it, but they, instead they they send the rough lumber down here, have it processed in Burlington. It was a lot of extra handling, so it didn't really make any economic sense without the tariff. And so when the tariff went away, so did that. So what happened was uh, these mills closed and the waterfront became very derelict. There were, um, it, it was just overgrown with weeds and there was a junkyard and it was, it was bad. Nobody wanted to really be down there, you know, and so a battle when Bernie Sanders came in, or maybe even a little before, um, see the railroad had created acres and acres of land uh, on the waterfront, flat land, because the original uh, site uh, along Burlington's waterfront, the land slopes steeply down to the water. So they needed to create all this land for the mills and factories and rail lines and everything else. So what happened was, there was a big battle over who owns this land. The railroad said, it's ours, we created it. Um, and so there was this thing called the public trust doctrine that got involved in. I don't understand all the legalities, but anyway, cut to the end. Burlington ended up winning, so that land became public land. And so the current waterfront park, which you know, I think everybody would agree is a huge asset for Burlington, um, that resulted in the re revitalization. The oil tanks were taken down, and it just became you know, a green space, uh, an event space, and much more welcoming to the public than it ever had been before. That's really interesting. So I, I want to, before we um, uh, wrap up or turn to another story, I want to just uh, take a minute to focus back on this Facebook group that you've built, which is yeah. really impressive, and understand a little bit about what, uh, first of all, what the difference is between the history that we typically think of that happens in classrooms and in books uh, compared to what you've built, which is a really engaging, reciprocal community of people that are reflecting on Burlington's history together. What value does that bring to the stories and the, and the buildings that you're, that you're kind of uh, talking about in that, in that group? Yeah, well, I mean, you're asking me to blow my own horn, so here I go, I guess. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> well, you know, I, like I said, it's all about the images to me. You can tell a story, but if you have images, showing people what that building looked like when it was here. You know, this one's been gone for 60 years. It really, really drives everything home. And it just pulls everything together. And it just brings the story to life, I think. So I've really focused on images. Uh, I, I did not want my group to turn into a chat room. I've been really strict about that, you know, like, uh, you know, remember Charlie's Red Hots. No, you gotta have a picture, you know, to get to get posted. And so um, it's really, and I, and I, only have a few posts a day. I was in another group and I posted some great gas station photos, I thought, but they, they were getting hundreds of posts a day. So you, it, it just got buried like in five minutes, you know, so, so I didn't want that to happen. So I've, I, I'm pretty demanding, I guess. And, you know, I, I, I want the group to remain tight. And so uh, the other thing was I, when I, before I started, I followed this guy on a blog and he said, if you want to have a successful blog or a Facebook group, you need to post almost every day. You can't like take a week off and you know, every other week. So, and I probably overdo it cause I post for three, four, five posts daily, you know? Um, but I'm trying to keep the interest up. And so, you know, I think it's been very successful. And I do also these long form stories, which I think you were referencing where I really get into the the detailed history and you know sometimes those, those go on for paragraphs um but those tend to generate less interest i will say because I, th I think people just you know they they like the short paragraph and one or two pictures and you know that's on to the next thing yeah. so what do you think gains the is there a pattern about what gains the most traction there what gets no the most yeah. about that um nostalgia is far far more popular than history i will say that categorically i've seen it over and over again if you post something that people remember in their lifetime um, just a recent example was a picture of the All-American Hero, which was a sub shop down on Main Street. You know, that was, the picture was from the 70s, so tons of people remember it. That got, that got massive response. Um, so, yeah, nostalgia is definitely what, what gets the most response, no question. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, what was today's post about? Uh, you know, I did them last night and scheduled them to go today. I'm trying, so I'm trying to remember. Um, I did four of them. One of them uh, is a picture of where police headquarters is now. Uh, the building, there was a six-family apartment building there. Uh, that was torn down in 29, so that was one of them. 
Um, and I'm blanking on the others. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just, I did them last night. There's so like many I, of them. Like I told you, I was working with my contractor for two days, and I'm kind of bush. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you, you talked about kind of curating this group to make sure that it, you know, uh, encourages engagement but doesn't become flooded with um, information or, uh, you know, become a chat room. Uh, do you ever have to kind of moderate the group itself, oh, yeah. and you know, how do you approach that? Well, I mean, you know, you don't want any abuse of other people or I don't tolerate any um, attacks on people, groups, and I, I include dead people, you know, it's like they have relatives still alive and you can't, you just can't, you know, harass people and or, or verbally attack them. That's one thing. And you do get a lot of people trying to sell stuff and, you know, junk like that. On the, <laughs> you have to moderate that. But I... The, the group is remarkably well behaved, considering there's 23,000 members. I don't have to do much of that, um, but I'm pretty strict. If somebody, you know, posts something that's bigoted or whatever, I just get rid of them. I don't even, I used to warn them, but then I got to keep a warning sheet of who's been warned. And, you know, I don't have time for all this. So, Is it just you who's moderating? That's it? My son is out on the West Coast and he helps. He, um, he's, you know, three hours different. And so he takes care of what, what are called the participation requests. Okay. Facebook changed their rules a couple years ago where any new, your first comment on any group, not just mine, has to be approved by the admins. And so I just let those accumulate during the day and he takes care of them. Some of them, you know, don't get up, some do. Um, but that takes a load off me. So, you know, your first comment may take a few hours to, to get on the group. Do you think you'll stick with it? Are you are you committed to uh, sticking around in the in the group? Well, you know, I I thought, oh, I, mean, I can maybe do this for two years, but it's been over three and a half, and uh, I got to admit, the book the book has kind of whetted my appetite to do another book, um, and I only have so much time, and you know, I only have so much time left. I'm 72, but um, I think to answer your question, I'll stop doing the group when I run out of interesting things to post. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, so many amazing stories in this book, Lost Burlington, uh, Vermont. Can you? Is, is there anything else that stands out in terms of a favorite story about Burlington and its, and its, its history that uh, you want to share with us? Well, I, one of the most interesting things that I found when I was researching the book was the story of the old Ethan Allen Club on College Street, where the Y is now. It, um, th this house went back to, I think, the 1830s. And it was owned by a wealthy merchant and his wife. His name was Peck. And um, th they bought the house. They didn't build it. They bought it, you know, existing. And they went through a massive renovation and um, just poured a ton of money into this house because he was wealthy. And then they had this gala grand opening or housewarming, whatever you want to call it. And people came from, you know, Burlington and surrounding towns and all the elite were there. They had Sherman's military band was playing. They had spotlight set up <laughs> so that it could go on into the night. And um, I think less than a month later, it turned out that Peck was bankrupt. Uh, <laughs> and so he left town, left his wife kind of there. And um, he only came back, I think, for his, his own funeral. Um, but anyway, uh, his wife became like a recluse. She didn't really want to see anybody after that. Shame, you know, shame was a big thing back in the old days. And um, I compare it to Miss Havisham with her crumbling, you know, wedding dress in uh, Great Expectations. Uh, after she died, you know, people came in and went through the house and her clothing was all hanging just as it had been like 40 years ago. Nothing had changed. The clothing was all ancient and, you know, so I thought that was a very interesting story um, that I didn't know about, you know. So th these are the things when you start peel back, peeling back the, the leaves of the artichoke, you find stuff like that. Yeah, that's wild. Are there any areas of Burlington history that you felt left some mysteries, some unresolved, uh, you know, stories where you kind of wanted to dig for more information and couldn't find anything? Couple come right to mind. Yeah. Why is Kilburn Street called Kilburn Street? Hmm. Um, I know it was the Kilburn and Gates furniture factory, that's common knowledge. That factory is still there. It stretches from Pine Street up to St. Paul, all along the uh, south side of Kilburn Street. But the company was Kilburn and Gates. Uh, actually, it was Gates and Kilburn. Then it was Kilburn and Gates because Stephen Gates died, and he was a senior partner, so I guess Kilburn was a senior partner after that. But Joel Gates was his partner, and Cheney Kilburn went to Philadelphia because the furniture in that factory was 
it was kits that they made and they were shipped to Philadelphia to be finished and sold. So Cheney Kilburn went to Philadelphia and spent the rest of his life there. He was only in Burlington for a couple, two, three, four years maybe. And Joel Gates was here his whole life. He ran that, whoops, I'm sorry. He ran that furniture factory and then he converted it to a cotton mill you know, the Chase Mill on uh, uh, the Winooski River. That was actually called the Chase Mill as well because it was owned by the same uh, group out of Fall River, Mass. But um, so why is it called Kilburn Street? This, that's a, why isn't it called Gate Street? It's, it's just a, a mystery to me. The other thing, and I have a theory about this other one, is the Howard Opera House, when it um, opened in 1879, it had a huge amphitheater where shows were put on and um, there was an interior dome and it had a pyramidal roof kind of like the Masonic Temple but not as steep and when the Howard Opera House closed in 1904 I think it stopped perf uh, no more performances the roof was taken off and it now has a flat roof it's like um, why did they do that a lot of expense flat roofs are not a good idea in Vermont and, you know, okay, there was a dome there, I guess, inside, and they didn't need it anymore, but why, why take the roof apart? That's the other one. that I, I, That's a head-scratcher to me. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So you mentioned another book that might be on the way, Bob. Can you tell us anything about what you're, <laughs> what you're cooking up here? Well, it would be, um, I kind of would be tilting toward giving people more of what they want. There would be much more nostalgia in it, some history, but it wouldn't go back as far, and it would be, popular sites, let's put it that way. Um, sites where people had a good time and a lot of places that people will still remember. I mean, this is nothing official. This is just an idea I have at this point. I, you know, I haven't, I have been asked by the publisher to do another book, but um, you know, nothing has been approved or anything. So, uh, but I think I know what people like. Um, you know, I think the Facebook group is verification of that. So, um, you know, but I don't want to really start writing a book when it's beautiful like this so I got to get my outdoor time you know <laughs> thank you so much Bob your book Lost Burlington Vermont uh, is available in stores now and thank you so much for joining us today Bob we really appreciate it my pleasure awesome. thanks for uh, watching Town Meeting TV my name is Bobby Lucier and uh, stay tuned for more programming